Good evening, councillors, members of the public in the uh, gallery there. Before we commence the meeting, I'd like to draw your attention to the fire drill which is on the uh, screen behind me. Uh, also, I'd ask you to turn your mobile phones either to off or to silent. Um, this is a public speaking uh, meeting. Uh, there are three items for uh, public speaking. Um, moving on to the main business, though. Uh, minutes of the meeting of the 30th of September have been on the table for the last 30 minutes. Are you content I sign these as a true record of that meeting? Agreed. Thank you. Emma, apologies for absence. We have apologies from councillors Jill Hargreaves and Martin Lear. Thank you. Declarations of interest, uh, Emma? Uh, prior to the meeting, councillors Hodge and Potts have declared pecuniary interests in item B3 and will be leaving the room for consideration of this item. Any other members? Town no. Town councillors, thank you. Standing order. Uh, have there been any questions from members of the public, Emma? Uh, none received. Thank you. And Elizabeth Sims, uh, can I ask you for any updates on government guidance or legislation that the committee should be aware of? Thank you, Chairman. Members, there is a key update for you. Since your last meeting, the government has published the Housing and Planning Bill, which you may be aware of, which is now working its way through Parliament. It does contain one or two key measures for development control. Firstly, it's proposing the introduction of a new form of permission in principle for small-scale housing developments on brownfield land. And it will apply on a site that is allocated for housing in a development plan or neighbourhood plan. And thereafter, only technical details consent will be needed to follow, a bit like reserve matters, I would imagine, that we have at the moment. To inform this, local planning authorities will have to keep a register of brownfield land and this will be land available suitable for housing for at least five dwellings and with no clear constraints on development. Secondly, the government has announced that it will be making the current permitted development rights for changes from office to residential permanent from May 2016. It was intended to cease then. The demolition of office blocks to achieve residential is also likely to become law. <coughs> In addition, similar rights are to be introduced from light industrial and laundrettes to housing, and this will all be subject to prior approval. And th thirdly, the new bill requires local planning authorities to promote the supply of starter homes for first-time buyers and for residential development to contain a specified proportion of starter homes, and starter homes are to become a part of the definition of affordable housing and we're expecting that the NPPF definition to be amended to reflect that. Um, there will also be a requirement for local planning authorities to make provision for serviced plots for self-build and custom build in new residential developments. And finally, the poorly performing authorities special measures regime is going to be extended to include non-major development. At present, as you'll be aware, it only includes major development in terms of assessing speed of determination and appeals. But the intention is to roll this out to include non-major development, which I think will be between one and nine dwellings. So, as I say, this is, this is a bill, it's not law yet, and we will keep members informed as it starts to pass its way through the process. And I hope that's been helpful and happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Chairman. Councillor Story. Thank you. Um, Elizabeth, do, do you have any indication of what might be defined as a starter home? Uh, because you know, one can see, yes, a starter home is, is something for um, the young couple, but how is that going to be defined? I think there is going to be a, um, a, a cut-off for it being occupied by someone under the age of 40, I believe, and at a discounted market rate, I think, of 80%. That's my understanding. But I can send you the full details on that um, tomorrow, if you would like that.
Right, so there are no further questions, members. I ask you to note that report from Elizabeth. Is that noted? Thank you very much. Thames Basin Heath Special Protection Area Position Statement. Uh, Elizabeth, would you like to add anything to the uh, report on uh, pages two and three of the agenda? There's nothing to add to the report. Thank you, Chairman. Members? Councillor McLeod. Thank you, Chairman. <coughs> I have a question, actually, about the review that you're planning every six months. The rate at which applications are coming through in the farm, and I think it will probably be the case that this number will be used up well before the six-month period uh, comes in. So I think you'll have to review it r rather more frequently. And I have a suggestion as well. If you actually did the calculation based on the number of people rather than the number of houses, you wouldn't need to review it because it would be a continuous process. So, so in, in fact, the, the, the SANG rules are actually based on people. This converting to houses is an artificial process which only causes confusion. So I would suggest you consider changing to number of people and uh, then it would be kept continuously up to date, the, the, the capacity available. You could, of course, switch that to houses as well if you, if you did the calculation by people. You could quite easily say at each report that would represent at the current rate of, of, of use this many houses still, still to go. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you, Chairman. Um, Councillor McLeod, I understand what you're saying. Um, you won't be surprised. No, I'm not the expert on, on this. I'm here to advise members in relation to planning applications as to whether in accordance with your policy um, there is sufficient capacity to um, sufficiently mitigate any effect on the SPA. I understand the concerns you're raising. I will pass them on to the head of planning and the policy team, and I'll ask them to respond to you um, in relation to those queries. Thank you very much, Chairman. Thank you, members. Are you content to note that report? Agreed. Thank you very much. Let's move on to item uh, seven, the quarterly appeals report. Uh, Louise Yandel, perhaps you would like to introduce this report? Thank you, Chairman. <clears throat> Members will note from the agenda that four appeals decisions have been received in the last quarter. The first appeal decision related to the erection of a new dwelling and the erection of a detached garage following the demolition of the existing garage at Two Wicket Hill. This was refused by committee because of the harm to the sylvan, semi-rural character of the area and because of the overbearing impact on the neighbouring properties and at 8 and 10 Battenball Lane. The inspector allowed the appeal, considering that the scale and form in relation to the size of the site would be appropriate, and concluded that the property would be located in acceptable separation from the adjoining properties. The second appeal decision related to the refusal of planning permission at Holly House on Sands Road. This was for the erection of extensions and alterations. This was refused because it was considered to be inappropriate greenbelt development, and because the height, bulk of mass would detract from the character of the existing dwelling. The inspector allowed the appeal, considering that whilst there would be an increase of 80% above the original dwelling, there would be no significant enlargement as a result of the proposal. And as such, the proposal would not result in a disproportionate addition over and above the size of the original dwelling. It would therefore not be an appropriate development in the green belt and would have an acceptable appearance in relation to the existing dwelling. The next appeal related to the erection of a detached dwelling and a detached garage at 100 Lodge Road together with the formation of a new vehicular access. This was refused because of the erosion of the semi-rural character and wooded appearance of the special area of environmental quality and because of the loss of trees. This again was allowed at appeal, with the inspector concluding that the dwelling would sit comfortably within its plot and that the building would be sited in a clearing, well set into the site, and as a result, any loss of trees would not materially impact on the wooded character of the area. The final appeal related to the lobster pot on Upper Hale Road. This was for an outline application for four dwellings for access and layout. This was refused because of the cramped and crowded appearance of the site, the adverse impact on the adjoining occupiers, the insufficient car parking provision and cycle parking provision, the unsatisfactory vehicular access arrangements for the restaurant and the impact on the special protection area. The applicant submitted an SPA agreement during the course of the appeal which overcome the final reason for refusal. 
The inspector then allowed the appeal, concluding that the proposal would have an acceptable appearance in the site and an acceptable impact on the adjoining occupiers. But he also concluded that there would be an acceptable level of car parking. Thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions on the, on the appeals. Thank you, Louise. Uh, Councillor Coburn. Thank you. It's not really a question, Louise, I'm afraid. It's uh, just a little rant. Um, I'm talking at uh, 100 Lodge Hill Road because I think this is typical of, of many of the ones that are happening in the Bourne. Yes, look at it from Lodge Hill Road, and you could say there's very little harm to the sylvan nature. I disagree, but you could say it. The whole point is Lodge Hill Road is what it is. It's a ridge, and the whole of the Bourne has these patterns of up and down and ridges. And there was a time when you could stand in the Bourne Woods, look across to Lodge Hill Road, and you would see trees. Now, if you do the same movement, you will see houses. It's from Dean Lane looking up. The whole of that area has been changed by the building that's been allowed. And I think this narrow looking at these areas, when we're dealing with an area of special environmental quality, which I, I agree we're going to have to redefine, but, you know, looking at it from a narrow point of view from the road, as the inspector has done, the fact that there's a couple of trees left, yes, you know, it's okay. Go the other side, have a look at it from the rear, and just see the damage that's been done to the whole of that wooded ridge. And it applies elsewhere in, in the borough, uh, in the uh, ward, you can see this the whole time where we're putting in more and more development and we're not looking at it from the, the whole point of view. We're not understanding the topography of the area and understanding the effect from the views across from all different areas. And I do hope when we make cases, um, we can ourselves put a lot of that into this because if we are going to defend the character, and I agree it's getting harder and harder, we are going to have to do it in a really much more sophisticated way than just saying there's no harm to the uh, well-wooded area from one particular place. So I'm not getting at you, Louise. I'm just having a general rant about looking at, at the sites completely in the round because, you know, what, what's harmful from the road might be, or not so harmful from the road, could be incredibly harmful from another uh, viewpoint, and that's what I'm saying. Councillor Story and Fraser. You do wonder what view the inspector took where it was taken from, don't you? Mm. Councillor Story. Thank you. Mine's not a question either. Um, I'm just very disappointed that four decisions overturned. Um, and uh, I can't even say that it's the committee overruling the officer's recommendations because three of them were delegated. Uh, and I'm just thinking that we're going to have to be... Uh, more aware of what inspections, uh, inspectors are going to say in view of Elizabeth's comments about the uh, extension of the special measures. Thank you, Councillor Story. I agree. Councillor Fraser. <clears throat> Continuing, Mr. Chairman, uh, a cynic might say that we have very little chance of getting anything through from appeals now. I wonder is there any established mechanism of response are we just to accept this and be convinced against against the committee against the officer's recommendation councillor coburn up there made a very good rant and i wonder whether it's possible for that rant to go back to the inspector thank you very much indeed uh, turn to elizabeth first i think or both of you. <laughs> I, I think, um, Chairman, that it, it, it is very disappointing when um, we lose appeals. And at the present time, there clearly is a, a very much a trend in favour of um, allowing appeals, which I think reflects the government's pro-growth agenda and the MPPF, which requires us to have very strong reasons to refuse. Um, and we try to take a pragmatic and reasonable approach, as we're required to, but when the council, whether it be the committee or indeed the officers uh, using their delegated powers, do refuse a decision, it's because we think there are very sound grounds to refuse it. But councillor's story is right. We have to have regard to inspectors' decisions. We have to be mindful of uh, the requirement on us to ensure there are not too many appeals allowed, and we do need to learn by these decisions. There have been instances whereby, on particular cases, we've been asked by uh, committees, not necessarily this one, but certainly some of the other committees, to write to the planning inspectorate to 
either query a decision or just to indicate that the, the councillors felt very strongly that the inspector has got it wrong, it won't surprise you to know that we usually don't get a very positive response back and the, um, unless the inspector has fundamentally flawed in his approach, we usually just get back, the inspector judged it as he's required to on its merits and came to the conclusion that he did. So whilst I think um, we will continue to be aggrieved by counter decisions, I think we've just probably got to accept the fact that that is an, an applicant's right to challenge our decision and if they uh, achieve the decision they want on appeal, that just is the system we have. But we'll continue to defend our decisions as, as strongly as we can. And maybe Erica wants to add something from the legal point of view. <laughs> Not particularly. Um, it's, uh, we can only challenge by way of judicial review, but then if the inspector has gone against the officer's recommendation, chances are, unless he's done something law unlawful in coming to that decision, then it wouldn't, we wouldn't have a case in court to stand up. So that's where it is at the moment. Thank you, Erica. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you, Councillor Fraser. We do win some. Right, I would ask you to note the report, the report please. Noted. Noted, thank you. And moving on to item eight, quarterly enforcement uh, report, Victoria. Thank you, thank you, Chairman. Um, councillors, um, I have no verbal updates for the uh, site-specific um, enforcement cases. Um, you may have noted on uh, page uh, 18 that we've had a slight dip in our um, local performance indicator to 75%. Uh, percent. Although this, um, we have um, met and slightly exceeded the target of 70%, we have had a, a, a slight dip. And I would uh, like to say that the reason for this is we've had a, a diversion of resources from the enforcement um, team to the area planning teams, which was a, a temporary measure, which has um, now come to an end. Um, on also, I'd like, uh, you may have noticed on page 17, top of page 17 on the summary of caseload, you may note that the um, cases on hand for the quarter were 206, and this is um, the lowest uh, cases on hand figure we have had. Thank you very much, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Are there any questions, members? In which case, I'd just like to record our thanks to enforcement for uh, the lower numbers, and uh, long may it continue in that downward trend. Um, just make the point that in the uh, uh, performance indicator, uh, the 75% also included the summer holiday period, so uh, I think they did particularly well. Thank you all for the report to note. Right. Item 9, applications for planning permission. Should we require a site visit at, um, as a result of this meeting, uh, it will be held on the 24th of November at a time to be agreed. Moving on to the planning applications, and these first lot are due for public speaking. Item uh, A1, WA 2015, 1454, land to the rear of Herring Court, 39, 4 Lane, Ford Lane, Recklesham. Rachel, it's all yours to present the case. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Members may recall that this item was reported to the September committee meeting, and it was deferred in allow in order to allow reconsultation on the amended plans. I'd also just point out, you will have noted there is another application on the same site on this agenda under item A2. Just a reminder that both are standalone applications and each are to be considered on their own individual merits. You will see the site highlighted in red on screen. The site is located to the north of Ford Lane and it's bounded on its sides by Woodland Drive and by Avery Lane. 
on site. You've got an existing building, Heron Court and Garage. Here we have an aerial view of the application site. You'll see labelled on screen the existing building, Heron Court, which is Grade 2 listed. A proposed site layout plan on screen. You'll see on the northern part of the site the proposal for the new dwelling and garage. You'll see the existing dwelling marked. This outline you'll see in red denotes recently approved extensions to the rear of Heron Court. And this proposal will use the existing access you'll see on the bottom right of the screen. Here you'll see the proposed elevations for the dwelling. It would measure 7.95 metres in height, 11 metres in depth and 15 metres in width. You'll see the proposed floor plans, the five bedroom, or four bedroom, sorry, dwelling. Members may well be aware there are two previous refusals on this site which are now currently at appeal. Here you'll see the three layout plans on screen for you to compare. This in the middle is the current proposal. Back in 2014, we had an application for two dwellings on site. Both of these used a new access off Avely Lane. And more recently, we had an application for a single dwelling This table summarises some of the key differences between those applications. Whilst the current, current proposal utilises the access off Ford Lane, you'll note that both previous schemes use the access off Avery Lane. You'll see the number's been reduced from the two dwellings we had in the original scheme. And you'll see that the ridge height has been reduced from both, both previous schemes. Here you'll see the proposed street scene from Ford Lane, which includes the amended access. And you'll see the proposed street scene from Avery Lane. Importantly, you'll note the difference in the heights between the existing and the proposed dwelling. Eight and a half metres for the existing dwelling here in court and 7.95. So you'll see it sit nicely behind that existing building. These vehicle tracking movements demonstrate that both a car and a light goods vehicle can enter, turn within the site and leave in forward gear. Take you through some site photographs now. Here we have the existing side elevation of Heron Court, looking, toward, looking rear within the site. Here we have a view along Ford Lane with the application site on the left. Two existing views of Heron Court. A further view of the application site in there. These photos show you the rear garden. Recently, works have commenced on the extensions, and the start of that has involved the demolition of the outbuilding. So this up-to-date photograph, it just illustrates that point where the outbuilding was cited previously. On screen here are the approved plans for extensions and alterations to the rear of Heron Court, which were recently granted. The report considers the cumulative impact of both the extensions and the new dwelling being implemented. Members are also asked to consider the cumulative impact of both these extensions and the current proposal being implemented. If I can now take you through the determining issues in relation to this application. They are firstly the principle of development, the planning history and the differences with the previous proposals, the housing land supply, the highways access and car parking, and the effect on the SPAs. For matters of judgment, the impact on visual amenity, the impact on a listed building, 
and the impact on residential amenity and on trees. Officers advised that the proposal, by virtue of its proposed access details, would fail to preserve the setting of Heron Court and would result in less than substantial harm to the building setting, which is part of the significance of the designated heritage asset, as the shared access would visually and physically connect the historic house with that proposed. Officers' advice is that the benefits to the application, by the way of its contribution to the housing land supply in the borough, within a developed area, or any other benefits, would not in this case outweigh that harm to the designated heritage asset. If I can now draw your attention to the update sheet, pages one to two. Members will note from this that works on the extensions to Heron Court have now commenced on site. You saw earlier the photograph of that. The agenda report does include an assessment of the in combination impact of both the extensions and the current proposal both being implemented. There have been two further letters of representation received. The agenda report is considered to be comprehensive in addressing the issues low raised within them. The recommendation, therefore, is that permission be refused for, reason, for the one reason and informatives one to two as set out on the agenda report. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much, uh, Rachel. As I said earlier, this is uh, an application subject to public speaking. Um, first, may I introduce the objector, Dr. Eric Coombs. You have uh, three minutes, please, uh, from the time you start talking, sir. Mr Chairman, councillors, the two applications for developments at Heron Court differ essentially only in the proposals for access to a new house. Both schemes are unsatisfactory, but the scheme now before you is preferable in respect of the very feature identified by the officers as a reason for refusal, the access from Ford Lane. If consent is given to either scheme, it should be to this one. We would ask that if refused, the grounds for refusal should explicitly exclude any objection to shared access, but should include objection to the positioning of the new house for which there is plenty of space further east. How could shared access from Ford Lane impinge on the visual primacy of Heron Court? A right of way is a legal concept, not a visible structure. Its only physical consequence would be a very short stretch of drive at the rear of the forecourt to a gate in the proposed boundary hedge barely visible from the road. How could it constitute in any way to the, how could it contribute in any way to the scheme's failure to preserve the setting of Heron Court? The route across the extensive forecourt would be well away from Heron Court's eastern elevation in which there are no windows. Unlike the, the presence of a new house immediately behind the historic house, the passage of occasional vehicles would cause neither disturbance nor reductions in reduction in privacy. The visual connection between Heron Court and its garage is nothing but an area of tarmac, separating those buildings far more widely than the new house would be separated from the old. Preserving the view of Heron Court from Ford Lane exactly as it is, seems now to have become an overriding priority for the officers, as if the street scene were a film set or a photo opportunity. This apparently leads to the assumption that it is more important to hide the new house behind Heron Court than to consider the immediate and, more importantly, the long-term consequences of placing it where it would deprive the historic house of an adequate and genuinely private back garden. This factor will be even more important when the now approved northern extension is built, which by doubling the depth of the house will further reduce space behind it and bring the habitable accommodation closer to the new house than in any previous application. The new house should be subordinate to the existing house, but the idea of hiding it is philistine. Our concern is for harmony and continuity not to complete changelessness, still less the pretense of changelessness. If a house needs to be hidden, it should not be built. Thank you. 
Thank you, Dr. Coombs. Uh, now introduce uh, Councillor John Ward, representing Farnham Town Council, who has three minutes, Councillor. Good evening, Councillors. Um, although these two applications are taken separately, much of what I'm going to say is going to be fairly repetitive for both of them, so I'll get it out of the way quickly. This has been a long and contentious application. Residents of the Bourne have always wanted to protect her in the court and its setting, and were delighted when it, it was included as a building of local merit. And of course, since the last refusal, as your officers have confirmed, it has, it has received national listing, together with its frontal wall. This has made a proper solution for this site, it not, more, not only highly desirable, but essential. Farnham Town Council welcomes the reduced scale of the proposed new house. Its size and mass are reduced, and the current proposal will have a far less harmful effect on Heron Court. There are main concerns about the curtilage of the existing house, as extensions are being carried out, and Farnham Town Council would seek assurance there has been adequate space around the enlarged property. The NPPF seeks to preserve the setting of heritage assets, and it's important that, the condi that conditions are included, which will enhance the setting of Heron Court with improved landscaping. There will inevitably be some harm to the setting of the original house, but we feel that the proposal is acceptable on balance. The main issue is access. And, uh, the previous proposals for access off Ford Lane involve changes to the existing listed wall, improved visibility displays which have changed the nature of the existing street scene. It was not entirely clear why this had to be the case, as the existing entrance is quite wide enough to accommodate most vehicles and could easily be shared. Uh, the photographs, the diagrams you've seen support that very well. Final Town Council has always been of the opinion the current state space between the existing house and its garage is not an area of great importance, and a right of way across such a space would be typical of many sites. The forecourt has been opened up greatly in the last few months, and it is believed and hoped that the applicant will be replacing much of the removed planting. Officers are concerned about the pressure for greater privacy, but there do appear to be no windows on the eastern elevation of Heron Court, and it is doubtful that the owners of either property would need to create walls or fences in the shared space. By utilising the existing entrance, the character of that part of Ford Lane will remain largely intact, and the harm to the wider area lessened. Farm Town Council thus feels able to support this particular application. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Ward. Now I move on to the supporter, Janet Long. Speak, you have three minutes. The form of the scheme layout and design has resulted from a great deal of work having been undertaken by the development team to ensure that all the requirements of your officers have been met. Uh, as has already been set out this evening, this is the third of a series of applications proposing development to the rear of the existing house. And following the refusal of the two-house scheme last year and a single house, revisions have been made to overcome concerns raised over the form of development. In this further revised scheme, the house has been significantly reduced in size that, such that it is appropriate to the site and will be less apparent when viewed from Ford Lane and Averley Lane. In summary, we consider the scheme as acceptable as there will be sufficient separation distance between the new house, Heron Court and other neighbouring properties. Tree planting alongside boundaries will be improved and enhanced. This will include replanting the bank and hedge along Averley Lane. And in this respect, we consider a condition attached to the permission requiring the provision and retention of landscaping will be able to deal with this aspect. It is important to note that in this application we've responded to concerns regarding the previously proposed access off Averley Lane and the new house is now proposed to be accessed off the existing driveway off Ford Lane. There have been no changes now required to the front drive, uh, to the front wall um, as Surrey County Council have accepted that the existing access can be used. This overcomes the concerns of the Council's Conservation and Heritage Officer. We consider that the only outstanding issue relates to the impact of the shared driveway upon Heron Court itself. However, it is clear from visiting the site, the existing forecourt of the house is an expanse of tarmac and very unattractive, hardly befitting the status of a listed building. Accordingly, our proposal 
although forming a shared access, will be able to improve the appearance of the area through a scheme of hard and soft landscaping. And again, this could be conditioned such that we will agree the works with your officers. In this case, we believe that we can offer an improvement to the property which will have no detrimental impact on the listed building. Given all the above factors, it is clear the site is suitable for development of a form and layout as now proposed. And as such, we hope you'll be able to support this application. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Long. Members, your turn. Councillor Coburn. Sorry, I was waiting for somebody else to leave it, but it's just my area, and I'll go first. Um, yes, I mean, here we are again, and I'm actually delighted with this proposal. Um, I feel we're there. I really do with this one. Uh, yes, it's not perfect, but then what is, you know? Um, I think this house, the scale, the mass, I, I, th I think is acceptable on the site. Um, I'm delighted to hear from uh, the, the applicant that if we go for this uh, layout, then we will have a condition to close up the Avely Lane access. Because I think what we felt very much uh, as local residents was that we did always drive past this uh, area, this, this house, the setting, and it never jarred. It was always a pleasant setting, and we were always worried about it because we knew uh, it was falling into disrepair. And I think to see a shared access as, as people have said more than uh, more than one you know it is a very ordinary tarmac space that we're dealing with here which could be enhanced it's typical of many um uh, joint accesses in in the bourne people do have shared drives to to access these plots and i actually think that this one will work i can understand the heritage officer and i can understand surrey but they only look at it from one point of view we have to look at it from different points of view um, the heritage officer looks at the setting of the listed building and says, yes, there will be some harm to this, and yes, maybe coming in through here, there, there will be some adverse effect on Heron Court. The Surrey officers come along and look at the access and say, well, if you open it up enough, there'll be enough room for these people to turn out onto Averley Lane, so tick that box, we can just about go along with that. But we're here looking at it in a much more, back to what I was saying earlier in my rant, holistic way. We live in this area. We know the area. We drive past it. We go round it. So what we're looking at is how this is going to affect not just Heron Court, which is important, but also the neighbours' amenity, neighbours on Avery Lane, neighbours around, the people that use these roads. You've got Middlebourne Lane, Avery Lane, Ford Lane all these roads coming together. And there is a sort of pattern to the development that was a very, very green aspect to Avery Lane, which has been destroyed, uh, much to the chagrin of local residents. And I actually think, I, I, I think this will tick more of the boxes than any other application on this site. I think the shared drive will work. I think there's plenty of space for it. I'm delighted to hear that it's going to be improved, because it certainly is not a thing of beauty. Whoever invented tarmac should really be taken out and shot, shouldn't he? I mean, it's just so ugly. Um, but, you know, if we can restore Averley Lane, if we can build this house, if we get the landscaping that's promised, we condition all of this, I think this application is actually acceptable, and I am just so relieved. Thank you, Councillor Coburn. Councillor Fraser. For the information of Councillor Coburn, Tar Macadam was invented by Mr. Macadam. Someone else put the tar on it. And could we go back, please, for a moment to the Google map, the Google um, plan there? Bear with me. I'm asking a question. That looks to be a shadow of a previous construction in the garden. That is the Waverley logo. Yeah. Oh, well, you can't build on that, can you? No. <laughs> as an as a, as a overall statement of, of opinion, I don't think we should be building in the garden, in, within the curtilage of a grade two listed building. Full stop. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Pritchard. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, 
I understand your comments, Councillor Fraser, but this isn't really garden grabbing. And I, the reason why I believe that to be the case is the pre previous um, uh, application, there was two properties, if, I, if I'm correct. And I do agree with Councillor Coburn, this is in keeping with the local area, and there is quite substantial space between the two properties. I think this will look very attractive. And I don't want to repeat what Councillor Coburn said, but I actually think this is... Um, I can't see any problems with this application, to be honest. I think it's a really attractive application. Councillor McLeod. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, I, too, like Councillor Fraser, prefer to see nothing built here. But I have to say, of all the various applications we've seen, this one certainly seems to be me to be the best one. And the, the, the officers say that there's no identified public benefit of, the, of this particular application as opposed to the Blue Lane one. But one strong public benefit is that this is actually the solution that all of the members of the public who live locally actually want and prefer. So it seems to me that is a pretty strong public benefit. Um, so the, the only other comment I would make is I, I, I will be supporting the application but I would ask the developer to take into account the comments that Dr. Coombs made about possibly moving the building a little bit to the, to, to the east side to, to reduce the impact on Hearn Court. That's just something I think the developer should consider. I think that would actually be to his benefit. But uh, that's up to the, the, the developer whether he will do that. But overall, I will be supporting this application. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor McLeod. I think, Rachel, you want to come in first? Thank you, Chairman, and thank you, Councillor McLeod. Just to come back on your point about move, repositioning the dwelling, if we were to grant permission, they would have to build in accordance with the plan, so it would have to be in this exact position. It would obviously change the considerations of probably officers, or could change the position if we were to move the dwelling, so it would have to be considered afresh. Thank you. So if I, if I may come back, Jim, I, I do understand that, it's, but it's up to the applicant. They can apply for a variation on the plan if they wish to. That's what I was suggesting. I do understand that you would have permission to build this as, as put forward. But thank you. Thank you for that. I think, I think we are done, aren't we? Um, Members, no further questions then. Do the officers wish to make any further comment? Elizabeth? Chairman, just um, to say that in listening to the debate, if members come to the conclusion that they do find the development acceptable, bearing in mind the heritage test, um, you will need to decide whether you disagree fundamentally that there is harm to the setting of the heritage test, sorry, the heritage asset in which case you feel it satisfactorily preserves the setting of the listed building, or if you find that there is harm, but you feel that the public benefit outweighs that harm. And whilst you might come to the same ultimate conclusion, if you are minded to grant it, you do need to make that distinction for purposes of carrying out the correct legal test and the test of the MPPF. So if the conclusion is reached that you want to grant it, you do need to articulate specifically whether you find that notwithstanding our advice, it does satisfactorily preserve the setting of the listed building and therefore doesn't cause harm, or if you feel there is harm, that, that there is a public benefit to outweigh that. I hope that's clear enough. Thank you, Chairman. Councillor Coburn. Yeah, can I just clarify that? Because we're not dealing with the building causing harm, because in one application the officers are saying that the building, you know, the, out, the benefit outweighs the harm, but in this one they're saying that it's the access, isn't it, that, that's the problem. So we've got to phrase it from that point of view, not the, the actual building itself. The development, yes. I mean, the development that's being proposed includes the access arrangements, and that's what is articulated in our report as, in our view, causing a harm. So that, that's what you need to focus on. Thank you. So uh, let's move on to the recommendation. The recommendation is that permission be refused for reasons one, and informed is one and two, as set out in the report. May I have those in favour of refusal? Please show. Uh, that's two. 
Those against? That's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Therefore, we need an alternative proposal and seconder, please. And reasons. Councillor Coven. Okay. <laughs> Do we have a seconder? Thank you, Councillor Story. Right, we're off. <laughs> right. I was uh, sort of taking out some of the, the words from the planning judgment on the, the one, the, the next one, because it, it, to me it's, it's one and the same thing. So uh, we, uh, I'm assuming that we the accept the the proposed subdivision of the plot is considered to be acceptable, and the dwellings of an appropriate scale, form, and design. This is all in the planning judgment. So can we do something on that? So we're uh, agreeing because we think the design, size, mass of the building, um, which, where, where do we have to start with? The, the, the fact that we're looking at the listed building. So the new building, by virtue of its scale, design and situation, will not cause, or any harm caused to the setting here in court will be outweighed by the benefit of the additional property. And by using the access off Ford Lane, the... Um, uh, the retention of the green hedge will uh, detract less, and that's putting it the other way around, but there will be no material harm or less harm to the setting uh, and the net character of the area. Well, any of those do? So to be clear, I think you're proposing that you don't think there would be substantial harm caused to the, to the, the, uh, the heritage assets, and therefore that the proposal, including the access satisfactorily preserves the setting of the listed building. The, uh, the public benefit outweighs the harm. It's, it's well, that's the distinction I'm trying to make. I think Councillor Coburn is suggesting that there wouldn't be harm caused. No, I think you are right. I think we have to say, because the, in an ideal world, there'd be nothing, and they, all the trees will go back and everything else. I mean, there has been harm to the setting of the listed building. It was done before the building was listed. So what we're trying to say is that there will be minimal harm to the setting of Heron Court. We, we have to accept that. But we feel that this application, by reason of the scale, mass, the position of the, and design of the house, uh, and the access through the existing shared drive, would, um, would cause less harm no, I can't do it that way around, can I? Or that you feel the benefits outweigh the harm that you've identified. That's the point. Thank you. We if that's need... helpful, Chairman, I think we can suggest some appropriate conditions that you yes, might want to apply. Yes, please. If, hand uh, over to Rachel. Rachel. Thank you, Chairman. Full of conditions. If I can first of all take you to item A2. I'm going to highlight to you quite a number of loads which could be transferred onto the current application, which I'll run through swiftly as I can. Um, first of all, we'll have a condition on drawing numbers. Second, second, we will have a materials and roof details condition. Three, rainwater goods being of a cast iron or cast aluminium. Condition four. Work to be undertaken with the ecological assessment submitted with the application. Five will contain the construction hours. Six will be preventing any flood lighting that doesn't it doesn't have separate permission. Condition six is removing permitted development rights for further windows on the southern and northern elevations of the building and that's to prevent 
any adverse impacts on amenity. We've got a condition on lower site levels, that's to control the ultimate height of the building and the ground level surrounding the new building. 10 is requiring details to be submitted of the proposed screen walls or other means of enclosure. Number 11 is details of any hard surfacing. Number 12 is removing permitted development rights for further extensions to the proposed new building. Number 13 requires that the garaging is retained for the parking of vehicles and domestic storage. Number 14 is a condition to, for the purposes of, of tree protection, and that's for details to be submitted and approved in writing by the local planning authority. Question 15, this also is for protecting on-site trees, is for details of services on-site to be submitted. 16 concerns the parking arrangements for the purposes of tree protection. Condition 17, and this will pick up, I think, on some of member, members' earlier points, is for a landscaping scheme to be submitted. Number 18 and 19 are both, again, about tree protection details. We also have a further condition 21, which control, requires a parking to be laid out on site before the development is occupied. Condition 22 is for a construction transport management plan to be submitted and agreed. And a, number 23 is a scheme to control the bulk movement of materials to or from the site. Twenty-four is requiring the obscure glazing of an ensuite bathroom window in the proposed dwelling. Number twenty-five is also concerning obscure glazing, this time in Heron Court. I've also got two further conditions I would suggest for you, again picking up on your earlier comments. Comparisons have been made with the Avery Lane access that is proposed as part of item A2. Members will be aware this has already been constructed on site. Um, the applicant has indicated that this would be closed up. To control this, I suggest a condition to require the applicant to submit a scheme detailing how that access will be closed off and a boundary restored with appropriate landscaping and a further condition to prevent, to remove permitted development rights for an um, access to be created on that lane in the future. If members feel that that access is harmful, that, that could be justified. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Rachel. Councillor Coburn. Yes, um, I, I'm fine with the uh, reconstruction of the, of the hedge, the uh, replanting the hedge, that's absolutely fine. Um, the applicant also kindly suggested that the treatment to the yes. um, drive would, would be improved. It, could we put that in as part of the condition of, on landscaping or whatever, whatever it would come in? Because, uh, you know, that, that shared space could be made um, really quite pleasant. And if, if we can have a condition to ensure that, that would be even better. Councillor Storey. Yeah, I'm um, sorry, Chairman. Um, can somebody tell me what condition seven is? Because condition six is the bottom of page 69, and condition eight is the top of page 70. I don't know what condition seven is. You can only read it if you're really intelligent. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. Richard. Thank you, Chairman. Just to clarify, that's a numbering error as opposed to a decision being a condition being miss, missing, so apologies for that, Chair. Elizabeth. Chairman, just, just to confirm that the reason um, for granting which Councillor Coburn is proposing would be formally articulated on any decision if the committee, who will vote on this in a moment, resolved to grant permission. You'll you recall, historically, we used to have a reason for granting permission on every decision, and that was removed by... Um, a change to the legislation, but it is specifically required for when permission is granted against um, a refusal of planning permission recommendation. So your reason and justification would be 
articulated in terms of the formal uh, grant of permission, if the committee agree with that. Thank you. Can we, could you read it out again, please, Elizabeth? So that the, the reason for granting that's been proposed by Councillor Coburn is in relation to the fact that whilst less than substantial harm will be caused to the setting of the um, heritage asset, um, that the benefits of the proposal uh, would outweigh that less than substantial harm in accordance with paragraph 134 of the National Planning Policy Framework. Thank you, Chairman. Right, members, you've heard the proposal. Councillor Pritch. Sorry, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just going back to um, condition five, would it be unreasonable to say that 7.30 in the morning with a nice loud kango hammer and various things like that would be a little bit antisocial for the neighbouring properties? So my proposal would be to change the hours to 8.30 to 6 p.m. and remove uh, construction on a Saturday, because I think just a Sunday, um, I think Monday to Friday is acceptable. I don't think work over weekend is acceptable. I think that would be antisocial for the local residents. I just wonder about any other comments that people might have as we approach the winter when presumably they're going to start work. Uh, it's going to be dark at 7.30, so I don't think builders are going to be uh, involved there. I've just uh, had a neighbour doing exactly the same thing. It seems to be a standard condition that we put on all building nowadays in uh, Waverley, 7.30 till uh, 1800, uh, Monday to Friday, and uh, uh, till one o'clock on a Saturday, no work on a Sunday or bank holiday. Chairman, okay. I think I agree. It is pretty standard, that. Yeah. Um, but ultimately, it's a matter of members' judgment if they... Well, regard to the particular circumstances they want to exclude those hours that is judgment for them mm. the applicant feels very strongly about it of course he can appeal the condition or seek to vary it subsequently but it is pretty standard as you say thank you yes erica did you want to come in at that point i just reiterate what elizabeth says i mean the applicant can always come back in to vary the hours anyway um possibly looking at um, starting a little bit later, but 8.30 I think might be a little bit too late and to exclude Saturdays might be a little bit unreasonable. Councillor Storey. Yes, Mr Chairman. I, I was going to be uh, um, suggesting that uh, these were standard, except that on page 105, which is another application, the hours are, are limited to 8 o'clock to 6 o'clock, Monday to Friday. <laughs> Uh, so I wondered if uh, perhaps we should standardise on something. <laughs> could, could I suggest then that we start uh, Monday to Friday 0800 to 1800 and uh, Saturday 0800 to 1300. No work on Sundays or bank holidays. A thought? Members? I think that would be acceptable, uh, Mr Chairman. Life is full of compromises, isn't it? Right. Can we move on then to the proposal by Councillor Coburn, seconded by Councillor Storey, that permission is granted with the conditions that we've already been through in some length. Can I have those in favour of granting planning permission? Those against? Two. Thank you. No abstentions. Thank you very much. Therefore, that plan
standing permission is granted. Moving on to uh, the same thing. But, um, Right. Application A2, WA2 2015-1456, erection of detached dwelling and double garage with new access off Avery Lane that land to the rear of Herring Court, uh, 39 Ford Lane, Recklesham. Let's move straight into uh, Rachel for your presentation. Thank you, Chairman. First, first point to note is that following a decision on A1, members should bear in mind this is now material consideration in the, determin of, in the determination of this current application. I won't repeat myself too much, but you'll see on screen the location plan and the site again outlined in red as for the previous application. You'll see the aerial view of the application site and the existing dwelling labelled on screen. Here we have the proposed site plan. The key difference with this application to item A1 that you've just seen is the access arrangements. You'll see the access is proposed onto Avely Lane with the existing access retained solely to serve Heron Court. The proposed dwelling and garage are the same in a are the same as that proposed under A1. So it's just the access details that are changing. Again, you'll see the outline of the recently approved extensions demarked in red. Here we have the proposed elevations. Again, these are the same elevations that you've just seen for item A1. Here we have the proposed street scene from Ford Lane. You'll see the existing access maintained just to serve the existing dwelling, Heron Court. Here we have the proposed street scene from Avely Lane. Again, you'll see a comparison in the height between the proposed dwelling and that existing. And you'll see below the proposed access coming off Avely Lane. The proposed floor plans. Here we have two plans showing vehicle tracking movements, the purpose of which is to demonstrate that both a private car and light goods vehicle could enter, turn and leave a site in a forward gear. Here we have a comparison between the two schemes currently at appeal, previously refused, and the current proposal. You'll see on the left-hand side the first scheme for two dwellings that also used the access off Avely Lane. On the right-hand side of the scheme, more recently, a scheme for a single new dwelling. This also used the access off Avely Lane. Here you will see a table comparing some of the differences with the appeal schemes. This is also in the agenda for which you will have noted. The key is to say that these are all using the same access point coming off Avery Lane. Those members who attended a site visit and will note that the access onto Avery Lane has already been formed on site although some further works will take place on it. You'll see this in the photo above. The existing side elevation of Heron Court. The view along Ford Lane. And some photos of the rear garden. This photo again shows you where the outbuilding was demolished on site. 
This screen shows you the extensions and alterations and the approved plans and elevations which were permitted for the rear of Heron Court. These need to be taken into account in the assessment of the current application. If I can now take you through the determining issues on this site. The matters of principle and technical judgment are the principle of development, the planning history and differences of the previous proposals, the housing land supply, highways access and car parking, and the effect on the SPAs. The matters of judgment in this case are the impact on visual amenity, the impact on a listed building, and the impact on residential amenity. Officers advise that the proposed subdivision of the plot is considered to be acceptable, and the proposed dwelling would be an appropriate scale, form, and design. The proposed access onto Averley Lane would be acceptable in highway safety terms, and suitable parking would be provided for both the existing and proposed dwellings. In respect of the access, there is a permitted development fallback position that does weigh in favour of the current proposal. Whilst the proposal would result in marginal dilution of the setting of Heron Court, this less than substantial harm would, in officers' view, be outweighed by the public benefit of a new dwelling. Officers have therefore concluded that there are no adverse impacts that would outweigh the benefits in this case. If I could now turn your attention to pages two to three of the update sheet. Members will again note that works on extensions to Heron Court have commenced on site and there have been two letters of representation received since the report was produced. However, the report is considered to be comprehensive in addressing the issues raised. The recommendation is that, commission, that permission be granted subject to permission, conditions 1 to 26 on pages 68 to 76 of the agenda and informative 1 to 9 on pages 77 to 78 of the agenda. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Rachel. Again, public speaking. And first of all, Dr. Coombs. Mr. Chairman, councillors, the alternative of shared access preferred by local residents and other consultees has now been approved, together with the plans for the new house. The applicant has already stated his intention to close up the newly created Averley Lane access if, um, if the previous um, application was approved. But in the circumstances, it's still appropriate for members to refuse Averley Lane, Averley Lane access in principle and to exclude the one already created being used as a fallback. It's a material consideration that the reasons for refusing the two previous applications, both proposing Averley Lane access, included their harmfulness to the sylvan or general character of the area. That character was clearly understood by the planning committee to include the relevant section of Averley Lane, a single track road lined on both sides by trees on raised banks, semi-rural in appearance. Since the current access proposal does not differ materially from the two refused applications, it fails to overcome the previous objections. Nor is the subsequent Grade 2 listing of Heron Court a material consideration that makes Averley Lane access any more acceptable. Despite the expressed views of planning committee members to say nothing of local residents and other consultees, the applicant has undertaken extensive tree clearance at earth movement to create an access to the site from Averley Lane. This is in the position proposed for access in the plans before you, almost directly opposite the driveway to number one Middlebourne Lane. Even if this work could legitimately be held to fall within the scope of permitted development, it will be governed by regulations applying only to the existing house. It does not create a prima facie case for accepting a permanent Averley Lane access for any new house. 
as the applicant's own heritage assessment explicitly recognises this would bring a newly suburban character to the lower section of the lane with irreversible loss of wildlife supporting habitat. The felled trees were covered in ivy of enormous value to bird and insect life. Extensive new hard standing would have to be laid down at the road edge and within the site. Even if the proposed visibility splay is deemed acceptable, local residents are very concerned about safety in the single track lane, particularly for pedestrians and cyclists. Widening the lane at the proposed access point might provide a small additional passing place, but this may only encourage even more vehicles to use the lane as a, as a rat run, especially at peak commuter time and school run times, and to do so at even greater speeds. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Coons. Moving on now to uh, one council award. Uh, thank you, Chairman. It's rather like a relay race, isn't it, passing the baton around over here? Um, I'm sure Council has got a long enough memory that I don't need to reiterate the first part of my earlier speaking. And now that this has been approved and become a material consideration, we're generally happy with, with the House. However, Farnham Town Council does not support and really objects to access off, way, off Averley Lane. In both the Farnham Design Statement and the Emerging Neighbourhood Plan, the character of each distinct area of Farnham has been the main concern of residents across the town. Much of the Bourne is still largely green uh, and semi-rural in character, despite numerous rather nasty little incursions into it. And there are numerous narrow lanes, many of which have no pavements, very little lighting, and Averley Lane is one such narrow lane. I sincerely hope that all councillors have been on a site visit because this is something you really have to look at to appreciate how awful it would be to have cars pouring out onto it. Since the applicant bought the site, there have been several unwelcome changes. Trees have been felled, part of the land sold off to a neighbouring property, but the biggest change has been the destruction of the high green bank along the western side of Averley Lane as you approach it from Ford Lane and also the addition of an ugly close boarded fence. Might a comment here that in the matters for judgment, trees appeared in your last application, but they seem to have disappeared from this one, which I find rather strange. Um, the applicant has sought to prove that the opening was created under permitted development rights. Um, I have grave doubts about that, but residents feel this has been a change too far, particularly before permission has been granted for any garden development. The basic character of that part of the lane has been destroyed, possibly in an attempt to sway opinion. The Heritage Officer has a very narrow remit to, prefer the, prefer, to protect sorry, the setting of Her Heron Court, but everything has to be weighed uh, in the public interest in determining this application. I might also say that um, uh, highways officers are, I'm sure, wonderful people with set squares and compasses in their own offices. Um, but as councillors in the last application raised, this is, is a holistic view which we would ask you to take, and uh, access onto this lane would be very, very detrimental to the area. Farnham Town Council would like to see the lane restored to its formal state, and this application, please, refused. And I just wonder, as a member of the public interested in protecting my local councillors, perhaps now having got permission, the developer might like to withdraw this application. Thank Council Ward. <laughs> Call on uh, Mrs. Uh, Janet Long. Thank you. This application proposes the same form and size of the new house as uh, councillors have already deemed to be acceptable. So the point to be questioned here is the access off Averley Lane. It is important to note that the driveway has been formed under permitted development rights and it would serve the new house. We consider it to be ex an acceptable access and it is the preferred access for the developer. The formation of the access has had the added benefit of improving highway safety along Averley Lane as it has created a passing place along a section of single track road. The county highway officer who attended the site visit commented on this fact and said he felt the lane is now safer for all road users.
As the access has been formed, it is also clear that sufficient sight lines exist which will allow for safe use of the driveway for both ingress and egress of both pedestrian, I'm sorry, of domestic cars and of uh, delivery vehicles. We are aware that there is concern over future gates and gate posts and the need to make sure the entrance doesn't look suburban. And in response to these concerns, we put point out that the treatment of fencing and replacement planting can be dealt with under a landscape condition. It is not proposed to have brick pillars or high gates, but only to have a post and rail fence with a low timber gate. This ensures the semi-rural feel of Averley Lane will be preserved. It is also that the case that this access will ensure that the existing arrangements of Ford Lane are not affected and there will be no works to the forecourt. Given all the above facts, it is clear that the site is suitable for development and we hope that you are now able to grant permission for this alternative access. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs Long. Members, now open up the uh, discussion to you again. Councillor Coburn. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I have never supported the access onto Overley Lane. I know we're never supposed to predetermine things, but I mean, I, my heart just sank when I saw what they'd done. As somebody who's driven up that lane, I don't know how many times, and always just seen it as, as what it is, a narrow green lane, as I, I think the town council said, so, so typical of, of many of the lanes in the Bourne and, and what gives the Bourne its charm. You know, we, we don't have, on many of our lanes, we don't have pavements, we don't have anything very suburban. And when we do, it, it, it stands out, it jars. And whereas we do accept progress and we've always welcomed new development and we try to, to, to be modern in our approach, there are certain essence, certain essential parts of the, of the Bourne that we just don't want to change. And we can accommodate um, development without having to destroy all the character that makes the Bourne so special. In the design statement, it, it is very much this semi-rural. Yes, we're very close to the town centre, but there is still that lovely feel of informality, if you like, along all these lanes. Walk along Avery Lane, Middlebourne Lane, any of these lanes, and these are, are, are relatively civilised compared to some in the Bourne. Uh, you know, we, we just have these narrow green lanes, and it's part of the Bourne, it's part of the character, and quite frankly, it did. It broke some of our hearts when we saw what they had done. It, it's like ripping out something that you cherish. Um, the hedgerow, you know, whatever they put back, it's going to take a long time to become that green bank that's been there for so long. So, um, you know, I, as I say, I, in the previous application, no problem with, with the house, but I think to rip out a hedge to destroy the very nature of this plot, which is really what, what has happened, is not the way to go about developing this. I think a house is fine. I think a shared access that would have minimum effect is fine. But to gouge out an enormous hole in, a, in a, an established hedgerow on a narrow lane, to me, it's, um, uh, it's quite unforgivable. It's probably too strong a word, but certainly it takes a lot of forgiving. Councillor Hodge. Um, <clears throat> Chairman, I have no issue with a separate and distinct access point for this house. It seems quite an obvious thing to do. Um, it, it's already gone, the bank. It looks great to me when I was there uh, viewing. Um, it gives good visibility from the house, um, from the drive rather, onto the road uh, and provides another passing point. I could see no reason why we would, we would refuse this. In council. Councillor Blackburn. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm sorry to say that I don't agree that there should be an entrance onto Averley Lane. Averley Lane is a lane, and although you can fiddle around with it in the immediate, and the immediate area of the new or entrance that is being now being provided, um, it is still um, a, a not wide enough for the needs of uh, pavements for children and various other things like this. It is very, very narrow, and there are 
um, there will be far too many vehicles coming up and down and that won't, uh, that won't um, ease the congestion that there will be at certain peak times, i.e. just before school or something like that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Blank. Right, thank you, members. Uh, do the officers wish to make any further comment? Elizabeth, thank you. In that case, uh, members, I move you to the recommendation that permission be granted, subject conditions 1 to 26, informatives 1 to 9 as set out in the report. I have those in favour of granting permission for this application. One, two. Thank you. Those against? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Abstentions? One. Thank you very much. Therefore, we need an alternative proposal to refuse. I need a proposal and seconder, please. Councillor Coburn, Councillor Blagden. Councillor Blagden, your proposal. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. My proposal is that um, the Averley Lane as, um, access to sorry, from the, the proposed dwelling um, should not have and access onto Averley Lane. So the proposal is to refuse this application? Yes. Councillor Coburn? Yes, I mean, I, I would certainly second that. Do you, do you want to know why? <laughs> so Please. We get to that point. <laughs> um, I think the proposed access would um, result, it would have a harmful effect on the street scene. Uh, and would be contrary to the uh, appearance of the character of the area. I think it destroys the character of the area. So something along those lines, I think it would have a detrimental effect on the street scene and would harm the, um, the, the natural um, aspect character of Averley Lane. So Heard the proposal to refuse. Do we need anything else? Do we need anything else, Elizabeth? I think we have enough, Chairman, on that to put a reason for refusal together. For Thank members. you very much. <laughs> Therefore, I put it to the committee, proposed by Councillor Blagden, seconded by Councillor Coburn, that permission be refused for the for the uh, reasons already stated. Those in favour of refusal. Those against? Two. Abstentions? No, sorry, none. Okay, therefore, planning permission for that one is refused. Thank you very much. I wonder if the officers who've got no further part would like to leave? No? Happy to stay? Okay, thank you very much indeed. Yeah, yeah there you go. Off to, off, to, off to the pub afterwards. Can we move to item uh, B1, WA 2015-1510, 7 Frencham Road, Farnham. Tim, yours to uh, introduce the application to the committee, please. So I thank you, Jim. So members, uh, the application site is located on the east side of Frencham Road uh, within the developed area of, of Farnham. Um, the area is largely characterised with residential. Um, there is the Ball and Rackets uh, Tennis Club to the north, uh, further north along the road. Um, this is an aerial photograph of the site. Um, the site contains an existing building that has three flats within it. Um, <clears throat> this is the existing site plan. The site does have um, 
quite a steep banking um, on its eastern side um, and generally forms the lie of the French and Row where it drops down from, from north to south. Uh, this is the existing elevations of the existing building. The, propose, the proposal um, is to demolish the existing building to provide five two-bedroom flats. Um, two flats would be at ground floor, two at first floor, and one in the, within the roof area. The uh, proposal includes um, retaining walls around the rear of the, of the site um, to account for the proposed parking. The proposed parking includes a lift operating system to serve four of the flats, whereby there would be an underground single space under each of these spaces here. These are just outlined here um, for your information. The, the circles are just to highlight the spaces, they're not uh, a detailed part of the scheme. This is the proposed elevations of the building. Um, it would be of traditional brick and tile form. Um, the flat in the, within the roof would have um, two front-facing dormer windows, um, which include Juliet balconies. Um, each flat would have some form of provision of outdoor amenity space. Uh, the ground floor would have rear patios. First floor would have balconies and the top floor, the Juliet balconies. This is the proposed side elevations of the building. Um, again, just showing you the architectural form that is proposed. Here are the proposed floor plans. We have the ground floor and first floor. As I said, two flats for each for each of the ground floor and first floor. You see the rear patios here for each flat and the rear balconies for the first floor flats. This is a proposed roof plan showing you the top floor flat and the layout of the roof on top. This is a section drawing um, across the front of the site. Um, You'll note here on the left-hand side just an indication of the, this proposed uh, lift parking system. This is some street scene drawings for you. Um, outlined in, in yellow is an outline of a previously refused scheme back in 2005. And this street scene at the top here is viewed from uh, Vicarage Hill, which is to the on the east of the site and you'll note that the significant drop in difference in levels as from this road you would see largely the roof elevation. So members the application includes um, uh, the use of a lift parking system. Um, this is photographs of an example of the design that they are proposing with this application. Um, it is designed so that one car can go in and be lifted down underneath, another one can rest on top. Um, each property would have, four of the properties would have their own one of these as laid out on the site plan. There's some site photographs for you. This is a view of uh, north of the site looking at the existing entrance. Um, you'll note the existing building there. The existing entrance would be utilised. And again, looking north on the existing access. Um, should be noted that the embankment would be cut into with the retaining wall. This fencing up here would, would obviously be removed. Um, and the proposed lift operating parking spaces would be here and here. This is the existing building. Um, you could say in a slightly tired appearance. Um, this is a view south on French and Road from further up, um, really just to help you give a, a context, you could say, in, in the street scene. Um, and you'll note, you'll see the building, existing building there, note the drop in levels um, on French and Road. Members, in terms of determining issues with this application, uh, this application follows an appeal decision for an identical scheme. Um, in terms of the built form 
layout, scale, design of the flats. This decision is attached to Annex 1 for your consideration. The appeal decision dismissed the previous application on the lack of appropriate parking levels. The previous scheme, four, five, two bedroom flats, proposed six parking spaces, which was four short of our guidelines. Um, the inspector um, dismissed the scheme and supported, off, supported the council in that case. The current application is considered to have addressed this with the provision of on-site parking in accordance with the council guidelines. The use of the lift operating system is considered by officers to be acceptable, albeit um, in an alternative format. The technical compliance means highways and parking considerations is on the left-hand side of the screen here. Um, however, the visual impact, impact on residential amenity and amenity space provided is for a matter of judgment, and the visual impact can include the uh, proposed use of lift parking system. So members, I'd like to draw your attention to the update sheet very quickly. Um, you'll note the first floor plan um, ended up in the wrong place, um, and uh, a condition was omitted on the original agenda, which that is there for your consideration. So subject to conditions and this extra condition, officers recommend permission be granted. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Members. Councillor Coburn. Everyone's very slow off the bar, aren't they? Um, I have to say, I thought your existing elevations uh, drawing rather flattered what's there, and I think your photographs showed more accurately what's on this site at the moment. It's not a thing of great beauty. And what is, as you look into the site at the moment, I've never quite worked out what it's meant to be, but it's, there's a sort of a platform and there's sometimes bins, there's sometimes seats. I mean, it's, it's, it causes a load of crashes as people try and work out what the heck is sitting in that corner of this particular site. So, you know, there is nobody uh, in the area, I don't think, who, who would treasure the, the existing building. Uh, parking is always an issue. There are three flats there at the moment and uh, sometimes when I have come back, people are struggling around the cars and it is dangerous because they, they have to come out onto the 287 which at that particular stage is going downhill from the traffic lights and people are always speeding unless they remember not to and most of them don't. Um, so we're starting here with, with a site that needs developing but the principle is certainly there. Uh, I think in an ideal world you know I'd have preferred them to come down in, in flats and lessen the parking but the more I look at this and the more I've, I've sort of work things out it's a bit like your first glass of red wine you know it's absolutely disgraceful isn't it you think why on earth do people drink this stuff and then the more you try it out the more you think oh there's something in this and it's a bit like this with this development when I first saw the um, the lifts I thought oh you're having a laugh here Tim you know I'm sorry I thought you know you're just winding me up um, you know wh why would we want that sort of thing in the born it's just totally inappropriate it's modern it's probably all right in uh, the middle of London but in the Bourne but you know the more you look at it and the more you think well it, you know what what do you do when you've got an, a narrow plot and it is narrow there because it's where Vicarage Hill joins uh, the 287 um, whatever you do on that site is going to be constrained and it's going to be difficult and I'm almost coming round to it. It obviously needs another couple of looks you know but I'm almost coming round to the fact that the worst that you could see from this parking is probably going to be no worse than what you can see from the 287 as you drive along it at the moment. So unless I hear any, anything to the, to the contrary, I'm, I'm warming much against my better judgment uh, to this lift system. I have huge worries about whether it's going to work, how long it's going to work. And we all live in houses where things break down the whole time and we have to wait for hours for people to come out and help us. Um, so I do hope we don't have somebody stranded six feet underground with everything, you know, a power cut or something. You know, the, it does frighten me a little bit, I have to be honest. Um, but if I can get reassurance that these things are pretty well foolproof and that the rest of the committee don't think I'm barking mad, I'm, I'm coming round to... Um, uh, sort of supporting this application. Thank you, Councillor Kirby. Councillor Story. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, th I think Councillor Kelvin has hit the nail on the head that, that this it revolves entirely around the lifts, and I'm not familiar with them. Um, is it the case that uh, the intention is that uh, a particular flat would have a designated two space um, with a lift, so one one flat gets two surface level spaces and the others get one of these. And are they strong enough to lift with both vehicles in place? Yes, Chairman, that's our understanding, yep. Thank you. In, in that case, um, I think it's a very neat way around the parking problem. Councillor Pritchard. I don't want to keep going on about these lifts, but um, say someone leaves their handbrake off and, it's, and it goes up and uh, all of a sudden the thing falls off. Um, I, I can't see how this can work, these lift things. I can think of all these different things which are going wrong. Snow, ice, someone turning up, um, you suddenly realise you've left something in your car and that's six feet, six feet under, and then you've got to lift it up and then you've got to pull the other car off. Um, I just I can't see this working these lifts like you say they they seem great a great idea have they been tested effectively is it right for this plan I don't think so my own personal thought on this is that uh, if the lift doesn't work you have problems parking there anyway. Therefore, the lifts will be maintained, I feel, by the company, and uh, it's not part of our judgment. I don't think really and truly to question the um, uh, the maintenance or the uh, running of the uh, this lift system. Anyway, I think wanted to come back, first of all, there are others to talk. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, Elizabeth just pointed out that there's a condition regarding the lift, but we could, secure, we could secure a legal agreement for them to maintain it. So then that would probably secure it more, I think, in the future, to make sure that if it does break down, then the occupants or whoever owns that lift will have to maintain it. Thank you very much indeed. Councillor Potts. Thank you, Chairman. I think... Um, we need, we need to be careful we don't get hung up on the lifts here. It seems to me it's a very pragmatic view and way to deal with, with an issue. Um, perhaps we could uh, learn for other developments that uh, come before us. Um, but as I say, I think it's, it's a very good idea. I like the design that's before us. Um, and quite frankly, I'm fully in support of it. And I think it's great news that by doing this, we've actually managed to secure the additional parking that was needed. Thank you for that. No. Councillor Hodge. Just to mirror what uh, Chairman, just to mirror what Councillor Potts has said, um, I think this is a novel approach to parking. Uh, it's brave and I applaud it. Um, it's, uh, if you Google it, it's very well used around the country, so I don't think we have any issues about, you know, it breaking or anything. Just put your handbrake on. Councillor Blagdon. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. In fact, this is not a novel idea uh, because uh, um, I think it was introduced by the Japanese in Tokyo where there are so little spaces that they, they go down about three or four, um, but, uh, which means you have to dial in and find the right car. Anyway, secondary to that, yes, it will work um, provided that all the necessary uh, facilities such as continuing power supply uh, are still guaranteed and that if anything goes wrong then especially on a Sunday or something like that it's going to be a bit difficult but thank you very much Mr. Trump. Thank you and they work in Germany too. Councillor Kevin. Yeah, can I just come back on the condition because you know the, the only reason you could um, accept this application is because of the parking system. I mean, yeah. that's why we're concentrating on the lifts. If we don't have this parking system, you can't park the cars on that side. Yeah. So we do have to make sure that our condition 
really is firm on that because we can't go three years down the line and them saying, well, you know, we're, we're going to scrap, not scrap the lifts, just not use them, and then you'd have over overflow because, as the inspector pointed out, that there just is no scope for overflow on this particular site. You've got Vicarage Hill, which is used the whole time, um, and the 287, which is just not usable. So, uh, you know, we do have to make sure the condition is very, very strict that in the future this parking system remains. Councillor McLeod. <clears throat> Thank you, Chairman. I, I'm a little bit conflicted about this one in that uh, I'm fully in support of using clever technology solutions to, to solve difficult problems. But the problem that's being solved here is that we've got a site that isn't really big enough for the development and we're, we're using technology to get around it. And will this set a precedent that we'll find this popping up all over Waverley, all over Farnham? Do we want to see these lifts all over the place? <laughs> Because it's a very neat solution if a developer's got a site that's too small and it enables sites that are really too small to be developed. And I'm not totally sure that we want to see that all over the place. Can I ask the officers, is there any example of this being used already anywhere in Waverley or in Farnham for that matter? Kevin, if I could pick that up. We're not aware of any other examples. I've certainly never come across it before. So from our viewpoint, it is novel. But uh, from what's been said around the chamber, obviously other members have come across them before, and certainly the evidence that's been put to us by the applicants that, that it's been tried and tested. I think in Sweden, Tim, it was, it was referenced certainly. Um, in other European countries, I think there is evidence that it's more widely used. Um, I think um, what I would say in terms of wider use of it, every example of it being put forward, of course, would have to be assessed on its own merits, and it may be other examples of it being used is not quite as satisfactory as perhaps it is here in that you know the, the structures may be more visible may be intrusive um, or there may be some other concern we've looked at this on its merits we started from the viewpoint that we we were coming from it that the problem of the shortage of parking which was supported on appeal needs to be dealt with properly and I think it's not, not unfair to say we were fairly sceptical about it being the solution, but we've had to, as we're required to, look at it, look at it from a viewpoint of does it satisfactorily overcome the problem? And we've come to the unbalanced recommendation that it probably does, but it does need to be tied down to ensure that it works. And we have recommended condition 13, as we've said, which requires the spaces to be available going forward um, Erica, our lawyer, suggests perhaps we should have shall be maintained and made available um, as an amendment to that condition to ensure that that we can actually um, enforce against it not being maintained. And perhaps, Chairman, with hindsight, we would add that that in to Condition 13. But um, yes, we think on balance it, it, it could work in this particular instance. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. And uh, just having Googled it. Uh, there are three and four story lift systems uh, in Germany uh, they are mentioned earlier they are in Japan, they are everywhere else There's Councillor Blackburn uh, Thank you Mr Chairman the slight problem uh, a trivial problem is the fact that the area in which it is built has got to be level and uh, certainly uh, Farnham is not grossly endowed with um, level places because there's an awful lot of up and an awful lot of down. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Anyone else? No? Uh, sorry, uh, Councillor Fraser. The vehicle lifts have been used and I have had some limited experience of them in the past and they are notoriously unreliable on that experience. But that may not apply to the new lifts. I s discussed this with my fellow councillors on the Farnham Town Council, and there's a precious five lines here in the agenda of their opinions. And I see absolutely no reason to change my opinion on what I've heard tonight. It is overdevelopment on a cramped site with an inappropriate parking system in a low density housing area. Yes, from my point of view, when I read the uh, inspector's um, appeal dismissal, really the 
thing we're talking about is parking and they have come up with a solution. Um, I think we would be on a hiding to nothing to go against something that provides the parking. It's happy with the building. It was purely the number of parking places. So I, I do have a fear of another appeal. I think in that case, um, if the officer has got nothing further to say, we'll move to the revised recommendation that permission be granted subject to conditions 1 to 14 and the additional condition 15 is set out on the update sheet. And, and the, sorry. It was 13 we were going to strengthen. Strengthen 13. Can I have those in favour of granting? Please show. Those against? Abstentions? One, two, three. Permission granted. Thank you very much. Item B3. Um, okay. Uh, da, 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 da. Okay, wrong page. Uh, B2, WA 2015 1730, erection of a two story. Two side extension following demolition of the existing store stroke garage at 7 Underhill Lane, Farnham. Tim. Thank you, Chairman. Members, the application site is um, within developed area Farnham, um, just off Underhill Lane, which is a single track lane. Um, the application site comprises a semi-detached two-storey dwelling. This is the aerial photograph of the site here. You can see the surroundings, um, largely residential. The proposal is for a two-storey side extension, um, which you can see here on the proposed site plan. Uh, the design of the proposal would be reflective of the existing property. Um, the proposal also includes the formation of two parking spaces at the front, This is a, the proposed proposal from the front elevation. The existing house is outlined here, and the proposal you can see here. The design has been taken to accord with the council's guidance um, on being set down and stepped back from the main building. From the rear, it would have two dormer windows inserted, and you can see here Again, the position of the ridge coming off lower down from the existing one and use of a hipped roof as the existing. This is a view from the side south elevation um, showing again the, showing the extension, um, use of a cat slide roof which currently exists and the side of the dormer window. This is a proposed ground floor plan. Um, Really, the proposal would extend, again, just further accommodation to the property. At first floor, um, it would provide an additional bedroom and bathroom slash dressing room at the rear. Some site photographs to show you. This is the existing front of the property. You'll note the garage and lean to conservatory here on the side would, would be demolished as part of the scheme. Um, you'll note the ridge would come in underneath the existing ridge and be constructed of materials to match the host dwelling. That's the garage to be demolished. This is a view from the rear of the property. Um, members should note that the at the rear of the properties along this particular road is a very steep bank which forms part of um, the rear outdoor garden spaces to properties. You can see the neighbouring property to the to the south, which has a, uh, a terrace um, to take advantage of the, of the raised height. And members, this is a view from the neighbours um, dining room window at ground floor level. Um, I thought it would be useful to show you this as the proposed extension does extend towards this neighbouring property. You'll note the existing building line of the 
how of the house on the site, the proposal would extend at that building line coming towards this way, um, leaving just over a metre to the boundary. So I should say, members, I didn't say at the start, but the application has been brought to committee as the applicant's employee of the council. Um, in terms of determining issues of this application, um, the matters of judgment are really the design and visual impact and the impact on residential amenity. Having considered the application, officers consider that design and scale to be acceptable and that there would not be material harm caused to the neighbouring amenity of the neighbouring amenities to the south. So officers' recommendation is for permission to be granted. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much, Tim. Members? Yeah. Councillor Coburn. Everyone's very shy tonight. I know they're all in the board. Yes, I do have slight concerns over this one. Um, the, I've forgotten the two bits. One was visual. What were the two bits you allowed us to look at, Tim? We're just down to two now. Um, the first one I didn't have any problem with. Right, the visual amenity. I actually, you know, think it's fine. But it's interesting, isn't it, looking at Underhill Lane, because back to what the Bourne's got, which is narrow lanes with these tiny little cottages, uh, and there's masses of them. And what's going to happen here is another tiny cottage is going to be twice the size it was. I have no problem with that, and I would do the same myself if I were in their position. But it, gradually, all these small houses are going. We're, we're, we're sort of knocking them into bigger houses as we go. That in itself, I don't have an objection to. Um, and I think the design sits well and, and uh, probably, can, as far as the street scene is concerned, which is limited anyway because of the nature of the, of the lane. I am a little concerned about the effect on the neighbour, and I, I would just like total reassurance that there is going to be no unacceptable overlooking of the one at five, because this is higher, isn't it? Number seven is higher. I've got it the right way around than number five. So whatever you do on that site is automatically higher. And I can remember we had one in, in Hale or somewhere up in, in the north, which we were very concerned about. Exactly the same reason. It was like moving the house much closer to the other house because, you know, the size of the extension was so large. So I just want total reassurance, please, that uh, the occupants of number five are not going to be unduly affected with, res uh, with privacy. Is that going to be um, acceptable, the loss of privacy, the loss of light? Uh, just generally, that I just need some more reassurance that uh, number five is not going to be too badly affected by this. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Um, yes, in terms of the, um, the existing property on site has a does have a first floor um, south facing window, um, which would which is uh, got the existing sorry the existing elevations. Uh, page one one six of the agenda at the top of the page you'll see the existing first floor window. Um, the proposal although it would extend toward the neighbouring boundary, it would result in a smaller window, and we have conditioned it to be obscurely glass, um, which would serve a bathroom. Um, the dormer windows at the back um, would be facing directly down the garden. Um, there is already some, to, to a degree, some visual interaction between outdoor amenity spaces, given the, the steep rise in gradients of the, of the gardens and what there is um, so in terms of overlooking um, officers satisfied that there would not be harmful in, in planning terms albeit the uh, obscure glass um, of the side window there would be a, a presence but um, we feel given its size and what it serves and the use of obscure glazing that would be acceptable um, in terms of uh, sunlight and, and daylight. Um, the site is positioned north of the neighbour to the south, um, so the path of the sun would not be affected. There are no um, windows on the north elevation of number five, the neighbour. The main windows are on the on the rear of the property. If I go to uh, um, this is a view from the site of the rear of the neighbour's property. Um, you'll note the nearest first floor window here. 
Um, officers have looked at that in terms of the impact. Um, it doesn't conflict with a 45 degree guidance in the council's SPD. This here um, shows you the, the rear patio of the neighboring property um, where they step up to further garden amenity space. Um, I think it's important to note that the, the proposal would have a hipped roof like this and the cat slide. Um, so although coming to further towards the boundary, um, we consider that given the design, scale and position, um, it would not be overbearing to the neighbouring amenities of, of number five to the south. Thank you. No further questions, members, officers, anything else? Nope. Therefore, uh, move to the recommendation that permission be granted subject conditions one to five and informative one as set out in the report. Those in favour of uh, granting, please show. Unanimous. Thank you very much. Item B3, WA 2015-1795, 11 Crondall Lane, Farnham. Tim. Thank you, Chairman. Um, members, the application site is within the developed area of Farnham again. Um, it is off Crondall Lane. It currently comprises of a semi-detached two-storey property. The application has been um, presented to you tonight at committee because the agent is a councillor. This is an aerial photograph of the of the site. Um, as you can see, largely residential in character. The garden does extend all the way towards the uh, another road at the back. The proposal is to do a single storey side extension following demolition of the existing lean to, which is currently a garage slash store room. In terms of the proposed elevations, this is the view from the front. Um, the proposal is to match an existing side extension, which is currently there at the property, which is this one here. The proposal is for this one here. Given the scale and design um, and relationship to neighbours, officers are, um, are satisfied with it. It will provide a utility and shower to the ground floor of the property. And here's site photographs showing the existing garage lean-to here, which would be replaced with a hipped tiled roof structure. You can just see the hip there at the back, which the proposal would be the same height. And again, members, in terms of master judgment, it is design, visual impact, and impact on residential immunity for your consideration. Officers consider it to be acceptable and therefore recommend permission be granted. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tim. Members, Williamson. Councillor Williamson. Thanks very much, Chairman. I, I noticed there were no objections from uh, from any of the neighbours, but on the photograph, I think it's probably number nine, is it? There, there seem to be windows looking out. Yes, there. Um, windows looking out onto the development, and those can't be very far away. There are um, windows at ground floor level on the side. Um, I've looked at the floor plans of the property next door and um, one serves a hallway and one serves a bathroom downstairs. Um, the proposed extension would actually be stepped slightly in from where the existing lean-to uh, extension currently lies, um, but given the, the difference really between what's existing and what's proposed and the fact that they're um, non-habitable rooms, officers um, not seem to be harmful. Come so, back. So. Thank you. So are you, are you saying that that window is in fact looking out over the existing extension? So therefore, the ones on ground floor for the, the lobby will look out onto the new extension, but you're saying that's not an issue? So no further comments, members. Let's move on to the uh, recommendation that permission be granted subject to conditions one to two and informatives one as set out in the report. Those in favour, please show. Uh, that's 
unanimous. Unanimous. Thank you all very much indeed. It's the end of the meeting. Thank you all. Thank you, Just make one comment, uh, thinking of Heron Court and other things. The sound of a chainsaw at 9 o'clock in the morning is on a Saturday morning is inevitably Monday morning's planning application arriving in the post. It, uh, it's a sad fact of life. Uh, developers do that, don't they?